Hello, and I guess welcome back. Uh, again, hope everyone is safe and sound and healthy, whether you're you know, under stay-at-home orders here in West Virginia or in another state, um, in the dorms here. First and foremost, I hope everybody has been healthy and safe. Um, this video is continuing the topic we had wrapped up, or started before spring break and the uh, switch to online education, that being point pattern analysis. So first I will do a very quick overview of some of the ideas that we were uh, working with before, starting with complete spatial randomness. So recall from weeks ago that in many ways our null hypothesis, it's not guaranteed, but our null hypothesis and point pattern analysis is frequently this idea of complete spatial randomness. And complete spatial randomness has two assumptions, two components to it. The first of these is that when randomly locating points, for any individual point, any location is equally likely. So a point can be anywhere with equal probability. The other component is that points are independent of each other. So if I tell you where the first 30 points are located in a point pattern, you have no way of knowing or having any better clue as to where the 31st point is found. So they are all independent of each other or located without respect to one another. So those are the two assumptions for complete spatial randomness. And the techniques that we saw or started with for point pattern analysis, we broke it down into two different approaches, density-based and distance-based. The two different approaches are in fact based upon these two assumptions. where the first assumption of complete spatial randomness leads us to look at density-based approaches like quadrats that we saw before spring break. Now we are focusing on distance-based approaches and we'll see two of them. One, the nearest neighbor R statistic. And Ripley's K function. So now we'll switch over and look at these two, starting with the nearest neighbor R statistic. <coughs> 
and I will also put up a point pattern to illustrate some ideas. So for the nearest neighbor statistic, as the name suggests, the first step we do is to measure the distance from every point to its nearest neighbor. So looking at this point pattern, in some cases, a pair of points will be nearest neighbors to each other. Sometimes that's not the case. Where from this point here, its nearest neighbor is up here in this little cluster, but that point's nearest neighbor is another one inside the cluster. So, as with the k nearest neighbor distance matrix um, that we saw when looking at spatial autocorrelation and the concept of neighborhoods again before spring break, this is not symmetric. So just because you're my nearest neighbor doesn't guarantee the other way around. Each distance, each arrow head, is included once. And we get both the average, we find the average of these distances, and that is notated an ND with a bar over it to say the average of the nearest neighbor distance. For the purposes of the statistic coming up, we also will compute basically the standard error of those distances. We'll be using it as a standard error, although it doesn't actually mean there's error in our measurement or our calculations. But as you see, we'll be using it um, kind of like the standard error in, say, the AAZ test. That's marked notated with a sigma NND, sigma of the nearest neighbor distance. And it's that number 0.26136. It's basically just the number that it is um, divided by. The, the square root of n times lambda, where n is the number of points. As well as their density within the study area. And this along with this average, we can use that to basically find our null distribution. We know if, based upon the nearest neighbor distance, the number of points, the density of points, we can get a good sense of what that, in a sense, ought to be under complete spatial randomness. So the nearest neighbor distance under randomness is based largely upon the density of points. And it so happens, 1 over 2 
square root of the distance of the density. If the points are random, I know the average distance from one point to its nearest neighbor should be pretty close to that. Given that, then I can say So if you remember the z-test to see if a particular observation was unusual given a distribution of scores, this in a way would look very similar. An observation minus the average divided by the standard error or standard deviation. Here we have the actual observation of the average distance to nearest neighbor, so the actual value minus what we expect under randomness, which is found through the density here, this NNDR. As with the z-test, we divide by the standard deviation. Here we divide by the standard error of the distances, again, based upon how many there are and how densely packed the points are. So I know under a null distribution, or a null hypothesis, this is going to follow z-scores, a normal distribution with a mean of one and, or mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Since we can use this like z-scores, we can now take this and put it into our statistical hypothesis um, or inferential statistics framework. So again, the null hypothesis, complete spatial randomness. As with the z-test and the t-tests that are very similar, we can do this as a one-tail or two-tail t-test, or z-test. If we do two-tail, it's just a question of is it random or is it not random. We can, though, do a one-tail test either in the clustered direction or the evenly distributed direction. I'll fill that in as I get a little bit further on here in the, this particular board. So I know, as I said, I can use a z-test following this particular distribution and use that to find, use that to identify if my points are random or not, or clustered or even. If my value here is close to zero, basically what that means is my average distance to nearest neighbor is pretty close to what I expect. If 
they are random. This difference is about zero. So if it's close to zero, it's random. If I do a two-tailed test, I can just say, well, it's not random. If I do a one-tailed test on the plus side, okay, the plus side, that would mean this average distance is a lot longer than what I would expect if they were randomly located. To get that average distance longer, they have to be spread apart. If they're spread apart, that would be an even distribution of points. A grid of points, or to take the tree example, an orchard. They're planted by people evenly spaced apart. On the flip side, if it's negative, the process of elimination already tells you it's clustered, that would mean this distance is less than random. The points are too close together than if they were random. That would probably be what happens here because of these two clusters. Here, all the, or most of the distances are shorter than we would expect. So they are clustered together because the points are, the distances are measuring within that cluster. Based upon this, as with all of the other tests, I can then get a p-value using a z-table that you can find in the textbook, that you can find online, and from that p-value, make a determination. Are my points clustered? Are they not? Am I going to take action because of that? Now this is good as far as it goes for nearest neighbor statistics. Transitioning to Ripley's K, this was the recognition, Dr. Ripley recognized, that by only looking at the distance to the single nearest neighbor, there is a lot of information that we are ignoring, that is being excluded. And so he's trying to come up with a way to make more use of all of the information from all of the distances, not just the nearest one distance. So making use of this additional information, we have Ripley's K function. Okay, the first thing to notice, I am very intentionally using the term function as opposed to a statistic, where before we had a single value, whether that is the nearest neighbor statistic, that is the T statistic for the T test, the F statistic for ANOVA, chi-squared statistic for the chi-squared test, Moran's I for spatial autocorrelation, if you have watched that video already. Here we do not have one single statistic. We have an entire function to work with, and it is a function based upon distance. So there's k function of distance here, and the way it works So we count, basically we count up how many pairs of points are within that distance d of each other, whether they are the nearest neighbor or not. And again, divide by the number of points times the density. So that part is the same as with the r function. 
But now instead of just looking at the nearest neighbor, I'm looking at all of them within a particular distance threshold. This can be basically very challenging to come up with what that expected function is under the null hypothesis. Like, unlike the R statistic, we don't have a very clear mathematical formula that we can apply because ultimately this is based not just on the, excuse me, upon the density and the number of points, it also ends up involving the shape of the study area. Typically, we don't have a nice normal shape for the study area. Um, think about West Virginia. So I'll draw West Virginia up here. Or some approximation thereof. If my distance is it, and I have a point here in the northern panhandle, the expected number of points, if they were randomly distributed, is not easy to do because part of that distance crosses the state boundary leaves the state. So there could be points there in that distance, but I don't know about them if my data is limited to the state of West Virginia. What this ends up meaning is the math is pretty much impossible for a nice formula. Therefore, instead of a formula, We use Monte Carlo simulations to come up with what Ripley's case should be under complete spatial randomness. So it basically ends up meaning if I have 58 points here, I just randomly scramble them. I assign their locations randomly within the state and I assume that means I have complete spatial randomness. And I calculate the K function. And I do that many, many, many times. 999 is a fairly common one, although within ArcGIS that will cause it to run a very long time. And what we end up getting is, as the name suggests, a function. A function of distance. Where a distance along the, the horizontal axis and the k function on the vertical. Under complete spatial randomness, this is by and large going to increase pretty gradually and constantly. So we end up getting ourselves an envelope of the K function under complete spatial randomness. Essentially, if our actual value lies inside that line, it is random. If, on the other hand, eventually at the, at the lowest end, it's always going to be zero. There's no points that are right on top of each other. And at the top end, the longest distance, well, every point is included. 
because it's the longest possible distance in the study area. But what happens in the middle can be important. And here, we essentially have two few points with that are that distance apart. They're all further than that distance apart. Because it says within the distance d, not just at that precise distance. So here, I expect a larger number of points that are that close to each other than is actually the case. So those points are too spread apart for it to register as random. On the other hand, if I have too many points that are within that distance threshold, it's going to go up quickly and then it can rejoin random. What happens here, a way to interpret That distance where it rejoins random, that's roughly how big the clusters are. If anything, that is overstating the size of the clusters. But it is more or less telling you, at distances shorter than this, there are too many points that are that close to each other. Beyond that, it's random. So now you're looking at distances that instead of the distance of points within the cluster, the distance of points, say, from one cluster to another, and then it would show up more as random. So I can interpret this as roughly the diameter of the cluster. So this is Ripley's k function. As, uh, as before, as with other techniques, and other videos. If you have questions, this is where I would stop and say if you have questions in class, uh, please ask them now. This is when you can email me questions, you can put them into the discussion board um, form on class content. Either approach is fine. I will have a follow-up video if there are questions that are better answered through drawing on the board as opposed to a written response. So now those are the two techniques that are based upon distance that we'll be looking at. Um, again, there is no lab for this topic because the software for our new uh, online environment, uh, Geoda, does not support it. Um, they are both in ArcGIS. You can look at that, I suppose, if you have access to ArcGIS, but I'm not assuming you have that access right now. So we will finish up with a few criticisms of point pattern analysis. first thing is we're comparing against complete spatial randomness as our null hypothesis. In some ways, this is kind of like every other null hypothesis, or almost every other null hypothesis, where we are assuming that basically there's nothing interesting going on in the null hypothesis. This illustrates if our points are random, are truly random, then ultimately the geography doesn't matter. So it's a very kind of philosophically silly idea to have this as our null hypothesis. That said, 
if you recall from the, especially from the distance-based topic, um, or not distance, density-based approach prior to spring break, and we could do this for the Monte Carlo simulations for density-based as well. We, we can set up our simulations, we can set up another, a different null hypothesis to compare against than complete spatial randomness. It ends up being more complex, but it is at least possible. So, yes, this is a critique, but it's one that we can fairly readily go around. The second critique, very much related because it is one of the assumptions of complete spatial randomness, spatial data, geographic data, rarely are they truly independent of each other. The response, the solution, is pretty much the same as with the first critique there. That is going to be more complex, but we can, whether through more complex mathematics in a density-based uh, approach, or more complex simulation strategy in a distance-based approach through the Monte Carlo simulations, we can address this. The third one is a bit harder to resolve, and it's kind of related to the modifiable aerial unit problem. So we're looking at and using the density and the stats. It assumes the number of points and the density of points which is based upon the study area is fixed. I can change the density by changing the number of points I can change the density by changing up the study area. It just makes that assumption it is kind of similar to, as I said, modifiable aerial unit problem. And ultimately, yes, that is a problem. However, the response would be um, trying to think carefully and thoughtfully about how we have those set up. So, is it something where I have a very good reason to use the points that I do? If you're looking at something that is within the state of West Virginia, explicitly and intentionally within the state, then the state boundaries are a decent, uh, are mandatory, a, a very sensible study area. Yes, if, I, if we changed up the state boundaries somehow, uh, then yes, this would change, but it may still be the appropriate unit for our analysis. The last critique is really the most philosophically important critique, because it's the hardest one to truly address. And that is equifinality. Equifinality is the situation in which different processes can give the exact same pattern. 
So, okay, different. So I find, okay, trees are clustered, for example. Whether I am using a density-based approach or a distance-based approach, I can find, yes, my trees are clustered. Even though they have different assumptions on to how the complete spatial randomness standard null hypothesis is broken, we still cannot really say, well, why are the trees clustered? If it is, in a sense, the first one, that the points are more likely to be found in one place than another, it could be that they prefer a certain soil type, or that they need to be near a stream to get more water. Both of those would be environmental factors making certain parts of the landscape more likely to have those trees than the rest of the landscape. That first assumption is broken. On the other hand, it could be entirely based upon the seed dispersal mechanism or propagation through roots, where as soon as one tree becomes established, that first tree could be anywhere. As soon as one tree becomes established, then its descendants are going to be nearby. So again, there's a cluster, but instead of it being a cluster because of the first assumption, it's a cluster because of the second assumption of complete spatial randomness being broken, where they are no longer independent, that the parent tree and the descendant trees have to be close to each other. Those are different processes, but they can give an identical pattern. They can give the same results. The only way around this is to bring in additional data where, okay, now I'm looking at the biology of that tree, how it works, and that may help me disentangle between those different possible hypotheses. Bringing in outside information can resolve this, but if all I have is the statistic itself, I cannot fix it. I cannot resolve it. And because of that need for additional information, that's why equifinality is ultimately the most serious and problematic of these four critiques. So that concludes point pattern analysis. As a reminder, because Geoda, our software for the remainder of the course, does not implement point pattern analysis, we will not have a lab on this subject. That said, the content is still fair game for quizzes, as we will have on this Friday, um, April 3rd, as well as the remaining exams for the course. So the content is still fair game. If you have questions, again, please email or please use the course content form in the discussion board section of eCampus. That concludes this. I hope everybody, again, is safe uh, and is healthy and I guess keep washing your hands. Take care.